Okay. Can you turn up the inside stuff on? Uh, hold on one second. Let me go through. It'll work on the camera. Yeah, it says it's on. Play us another tune, I have. to do with technology. I can screw it up. But we've got the mic going now. Good to see each one of you. Glad you're here. It's a little nippy. I hope you got a blanket or a coat or something. Maybe the fog will burn off in a minute. Uh, a few quick announcements. Women's Bible study online Thursdays at 7 o'clock. They're going through the book of Romans. Talk to Sandra if you want to be a part of that. If you want to know the Bible, this is a great Bible study to be in. This is not Beth Moore fluff. This is the Bible. So we want to encourage you to be a part of that. And there's a time of prayer that's associated with that as well. All right, young people are staying after the service for a game day. Don't know exactly what that means, but I'm sure it'll be fun. So if you're on the youngish end of the spectrum, hang around. The sun will come out eventually, and they're going to have fun. Men are meeting on Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. in the East Silva Shopping Center in the building that is just to the left of Jack the Dipper Ice Cream Shop. We have about 30 minutes of sermon review where we kind of dig deeper into the text that we're preaching on today and then we spend about a half hour praying and we're going to try to keep that to one hour because we know that that is a week now. Now I want to read from Isaiah chapter 42 verses 5 through 7 and in this text uh, God the Father is speaking to God the Son and the prophet Isaiah writes this, thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who give breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord, I have called you, you would be Jesus. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. To open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our covenant. And the covenant is this, that if we'll look away from ourselves and look to him and trust in his blood and righteousness and receive him as our God and King, we will most certainly be saved. Thank you that you have made him a light for the nations. And Lord, thank you that you have given to, uh, him to us as the light of life. Uh, thank you that there are so many of us here today who can testify that Jesus is our light. We pray that you would shine the truth in our hearts today as we sing, as we worship, as the word is preached, as we respond to the preached word. We pray that the light of Christ would be plain and bright and powerful in us. Holy Spirit, work in us today and cause us to love your dear Son. Uh, Lord, there are so many uh, false loves that are alluring to us, but we pray that Jesus would be sweet to us today. We ask, Lord, that the affections of our heart would burn bright for him. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would draw us to yourself, that you would draw unbelievers to yourself. Uh, we, we pray that Jesus would be the treasure of our heart, the delight of our life, uh, the hope of our souls. And we ask, Lord, that weighty matters and eternal matters would be at the forefront of our mind and that we would be more ready to meet you having been here today than we, than we were when we came. And Father, we thank you that Jesus is one who brings prisoners from the dungeon. Uh, Jesus is one who brings from prison those who sit in darkness. Jesus is one who opens blind eyes. Jesus is the light of the world, Lord. So where there's darkness in our hearts, we ask that you would dispel it today. Uh, where there are those 
whose minds and hearts are completely in darkness because they don't know you. Would you cause them to be born again today, Father, by the power that enables you to subject all things to yourself? Uh, be pleased with our worship. Be pleased uh, with the direction of our thoughts and our hearts and our minds. And, and just be pleased with all that goes on here this morning. We ask that Jesus Christ would be glorified. We pray this in his dear name. Amen. If you'll stand, the first song we're going to sing is a song that you know, I probably never heard this song until I was 35. And the first couple of times I heard this song, I thought, I really don't like the tune of this song. And then after the fourth or fifth time, I thought, I really like this song. This song talks about God's power. It talks about the fact that God is our fortress and that God wins in the end. Let's sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. <laughs> Six here in November. And no surprise, but um, I know I'm supposed to look up when I'm talking and reading and everything, but I can't. If I look up, then I get distracted and I forget what I was going to say. And that's the other reason I've got all these uh, notes here. So I'm trying to stay focused. He'd asked me to read uh, John 1, 
one through five. And uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the light, and uh, he is the illuminator. Apart from Christ, everything is dark. All true preachers are sent from God to declare the true witness and testimony concerning Christ. People come to salvation by believing preachers and believing people. And I had somebody tell me about Jesus one time for over a year when I finally got saved. Uh, the goal of the gospel ministry is believing. That's the goal. Um, Jesus illuminates the true nature of God. Everyone who is enlightened is in, enlightened by Jesus. His illumination exposes men as sinners. Uh, it is one thing to reject the law. You know, you can, you can reject what the old prophet said. You can reject the old testament you can reject the law of god and the word but it's another thing to reject jesus the thing about jesus is you know it is god that came down to us in flesh and for a person to reject jesus and what he brought to us and what he taught for a person to do that is the ultimate depravity of all the sins we could ever do, that is the worst, the most heinous. That would be the ultimate of the lowest part of our total depravity that a man could do is to reject Jesus. But uh, God is by nature the Savior, and the nature of ministry is to present Christ. Uh, when I come up here, Every week to read the scripture. I don't. I don't talk to friend about. I don't know really what he's going to cover in the top of his sermon or what uh, verses he's going to highlight on. But uh, the thing about the word, it, it teaches about itself. And uh, we just want to pray about this verse today and the verses that he's going to preach on today. And uh, let's pray together. And God, we thank you that uh, you enable us to meet today and. In spite of this weather and in spite of everything that's uh, facing us throughout the week, but God, you brought us together today, and we just seek to bring you honor, and we seek to learn more about you. Lord, we just pray that you help Brent in his effort to share your word with us. And God, in our prayers this week, we just want to pray for our growing church here. And we just want to pray, Lord, that you just lead us to a place where we can all worship together, and that uh, you would answer our prayers for us. Um, so many things we've been praying about here as a church. And we just want to ask you, Lord, for our continued growth. We need deacons. We need elders. Lord, we just need uh, teachers. We need people to help with the music. And we've got so many faucets of avenues of places where we need help and improvement. And, and all that we do is just not a big numbers thing here we're doing, but it's just a thing where we just want to bring, you, uh, bring the people the truth of the word and, and to... Uh, break the bread of life during a way that is going to honor you and that uh, we can all have a deeper walk with you God we just thank you for this time together and just help us with our efforts today and we praise you Lord, Amen We are getting a little sun now so you might have to shift your seat around and get in the sun, it feels really good Now before we sing this next song let me ask you this question, what do you glory in? What do you glory in? What does it mean to glory in something? We don't use that word a whole lot outside of a Bible context and a church context. But the glory in something means that you delight in it, that you're satisfied in it, that you rejoice in it. So uh, a phrase that we use that might capture the meaning is this, what turns you on? What turns you on? Let's stand and sing, I will glory in my Redeemer.
Christians glory in Christ.
forward as far as the temperature goes is this. If it gets any colder, we're going to not meet at 1030. We'll meet at noon or something and let the sun come out. Because, uh, I don't know about you, I feel pretty chilly. The sun did come out for 30 seconds and it went back in, so to speak. Uh, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that we're able to be here. We're thankful that you've given us a place to meet outside uh, for the last couple of months. Uh, we're thankful that uh, Barry and Colette have been gracious enough to let us use this property. and We're thankful that you inclined their hearts in that direction. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would give us uh, wisdom about where to meet going forward. Uh, there, there's a time, Lord, where we can move the uh, service back to later in the day and let it warm up, but eventually it will get too cold to meet outside, and so we pray, Lord, for a spacious indoor place to meet in the near future. We ask that you would meet that need for us. Uh, we pray, Father, that as we come to the Word, that you would work mightily in us through the Word, that you would cause your Word to penetrate into our hearts and to change the way we think, uh, the way we see reality, the way we see others, the way we see ourselves, the way we see you, Father. Uh, we are blind without your truth. We are hopeless without your grace. We are dead without your spirit who gives life. And so we pray that you would enable us to pay attention. Uh, we pray that we would not be distracted. We ask, Lord, uh, that you would bring someone from death to life today as the word is preached. We pray that you would save someone, uh, maybe multiple someones. We pray that you would edify your saints. And we pray, Lord, uh, uh, just against uh, remote control airplanes and trucks and hay balers and whatever else would be here to distract us, that our hearts would be turned up toward you, uh, wanting to hear from you, wanting to receive from you. And I ask that Christ will be glorified, Lord. I pray that he'll be glorified in our hearts as Savior, as King, as God of all creation. I pray that uh, we would just know him and leave here changed. I ask, Lord, that as I preach, that you would put words in my mouth, Lord. There are good words and there are better words and there are best words. I pray that you give me the best words, Lord. Uh, words that people need, words of life. I pray that you'd help me not to say anything that would bring reproach to you or be untrue. I pray that you would be pleased, Lord, with my preaching and that you would be the source of my preaching and that I would be able to personally know you better uh, through the act of preaching your word to these people this morning. Lord, I want to know you better. Uh, so grant me fellowship with you as I preach. And Lord, I pray that you would forgive me for the countless ways that I have failed you this week, uh, most of all by not loving Christ more than anything else. Uh, that, that is my greatest sin, that Christ is often not the thing, the person that I love most. So give me more love for him. I pray, Lord, that you would give us all more love for Christ. And just remind us as we go through this text that none of us will be here uh, 100 years from now, maybe not even 70 years from now. None of us may be here next week, Lord. We do not know what the future holds. Uh, except for this. It is appointed unto man once to die and then comes the judgment. And so we don't want to fool ourselves about where we stand with you. Uh, Lord, we live in a nation that's full of prophets that heal people's wounds lightly. And Lord, I'm sure that there's people online or even here in person whose wounds have been healed lightly. Uh, Lord, you're not mocked. You're not deceived. Whatever a man sows, that will he reap. So help us to know where we stand with you. And if we're in a state of grace, Lord, Increase our assurance, and if there's anyone here or listening online who is not in a state of grace, Lord, we pray that they would know that and that they would flee to Christ today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So hopefully you have found John 8, 12. And so uh, we've been going through the book of John for, gosh, six or seven months, something like that. We took a few Sundays off and preached a psalm here and there. Uh, but obviously the question would be, why are we going to start verse 12? And not in John 8, 1. And the reason would be because John did not write John 8, 1 through 11. Okay? So if you uh, have a King James Version, it probably doesn't have brackets around it, John 8, 1 through 11. But if you've got a more modern version of the Bible, there's, there's brackets around John 8, 1 through 11. And if you look at footnote, it'll say, uh, John 8, 1 through 11 is not in the oldest manuscript of John's Gospel. And so uh, since we're preaching John's Gospel... And John didn't write John 8, 1 through 11. We're not going to do John 8, 1 through 11. And uh, the reason that it is in most of our Bibles, uh, even if it is in brackets, is this. Uh, the translations of the Bible that were done in the 1400s, 1500s, 
1611 King James, were based on something called the, the Textus Receptus, uh, which was formed from about six Greek manuscripts, okay? And those all dated to around 1000 AD. And by that time, uh, the story of the woman caught in adultery had worked its way into a certain strand of the text of Scripture. And the people that did the Textus Receptus were just looking at that strand of text. They, they formed that from about six Greek, Greek manuscripts. But now... We don't have six Greek manuscripts. We have about 22,000 uh, Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. And some of them date all the way back to the 2nd century A.D. So, not from 1,000 A.D., all the way back to the 2nd century A.D. And what we found out since then is that all these old versions of John's Gospel that date all the way back to the 2nd century A.D., And so uh, we know that that was added later on uh, by scribes. Who knows? I, I don't know. Did, did uh, the story of the woman caught in adultery and, uh, hey, Jesus, let's stone her. Whoever among you is without sin, cast the first stone. Jesus scribbled on the ground. Did that happen? I don't know. I have no idea. But I do know this. John didn't write it. Okay? And so since, since we believe that the Holy Spirit carried along the apostles and told them what to put on the paper, and we know John didn't write it, then we know that the Spirit didn't inspire John to write John 8, 1 through 11. Uh, this story of the woman caught in the act of adultery, uh, in one Greek manuscript, it is found after John chapter 21. In what they call the Family 13 manuscripts, the story of the woman caught in adultery is found after Luke, chapter 21. It's not even in John's gospel. Uh, in another manuscript, it's after Luke chapter 24. So it, you can tell if you look at the older manuscripts that it was a story looking for a place to hide, I guess, <laughs> or manifest itself, however you want to put it. But you know, I kind of hate to start a sermon off with a, a text that I'm not preaching on, but I don't want any of you to be sitting there scratching your head and say, hey, how come Brent skipped all these verses? We're skipping them because John didn't write them, Okay. So when you're reading through John's Gospel, you ought to read, if, if you want to know what John wrote, you ought to read from chapter 7, verse 52, and go straight to verse uh, chapter 8, verse 12, okay? Does that make any sense? If you got any questions, ask me later. I know that's over some of your heads, and some of you don't care, and some of you really like it. But anyway, we're going to go to John 8, 12, okay? We're going to read that. We're going to read 12 through 30. Again, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, uh, what was the previous speaking? When he was... At the Feast of Booths, he said, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, uh, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Well, he's still at the Feast of Booths. And again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, Therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. But no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself, since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. 
But he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I've heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed. So once again, we are still at the Feast of Tabernacles, where we were last week in chapter 7. John chapter 7 and John chapter 8, uh, both of those chapters take place at the Feast of Tabernacles. And remember, the Feast of Tabernacles is a time when the Jews uh, went up to Jerusalem and they took leafy branches and sticks and they made these little huts and they stayed in them for a week to celebrate the time when they wandered in the wilderness and stayed in booths tabernacles or tents, whatever you want to call them. And what they were celebrating uh, was the way that God sustained them during their wilderness wanderings. And one of the things that happened during this feast is that four huge lamps, uh, candelabras, whatever you want to call them, were lit in the temple's court of women. And this joyous celebration took place underneath the light of those candles. And the Jewish men would also light torches. And they would dance around under the light of these candles. And uh, the Temple Mount was raised up. It was at the highest place in Jerusalem. And so when they lit these lamps and they burned these torches, the whole city would be flooded with the glow of the light from these torches. And the reason uh, that they were lighting these lights is because they were commemorating that, that when they wandered in the wilderness, they were led by night by a pillar of fire. Do you remember that? that that's why they lit all these lights. They said, you, you remember, God led us in the wilderness by night in a pillar of fire that shed light on us. And so they had this ceremony of lamp lighting to commemorate God leading them in a pillar of fire. Jesus says against that backdrop, look at verse 12, Think about, think about all these lamps being lit. Think about all these people dancing with torches. Think about this glow that's being shed over Jerusalem. And that's the background for verse 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So what is Jesus saying about himself in John 8? When he says, I am the light of the world. Let's look at this claim. He claims to be the light of the world. What does he mean by this statement? Well, light is symbolic of several different things in Scripture. Uh, firstly, light symbolizes knowledge and understanding and truth. So these Jews who are responding to Jesus in John 8, they cannot perceive the truth about Jesus. Why? Because their mind is darkened. They don't have the light of life. Look at verse 13. Verse 13. So the Pharisees said to him, You're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. So here is Jesus, the way and the truth and the life. Here's Jesus, the embodiment of truth. And these people say, Your testimony is not true. How can they not see that Jesus' testimony is true? Their understanding is is darkened. They don't have the light of life. And Paul says this about the human mind apart from Christ. This is Ephesians 4, 17 to 18. Paul says, This I say and testify in the Lord. He's telling Christians this. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. Paul told the Ephesian church that people who do not know Christ uh, experience a certain futility of the mind, darkened in their understanding because of the ignorance that is in them. And these Jews are showing this ignorance that Paul spoke of in Ephesians 4. Uh, they're in the dark about who Jesus is. They're in the dark about who the Father is. Uh, they're in the dark about where Jesus came from, whether or not he's teaching the truth, whether he can be trusted. When Jesus speaks, they just scratch their heads and they can't figure out what he's trying to say. Their mind is darkened 
And so they cannot perceive the truth about Jesus. Uh, look at how unable they are to see the truth about Jesus in their interactions with him. Look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. And you'll see the darkness of their mind apart from Christ. Verse 14, Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. In other words, Jesus says, you don't know who I am. You don't know where I came from. You don't know what my mission is. You don't know what my purpose is. You're totally in the dark about all those things. Look at verse 15. You judge according to the flesh. In other words, you're evaluating what I'm saying. You're forming opinions about who I am and my teaching. And all of your judgments are based on a mind that is darkened and controlled by sin. You judge according to the flesh. Verse 18 and 19. Look there with me, please. Jesus says, I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. So they said to him, therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my Father. You knew me. You would know my Father also. There's this lack of of knowing in these Jews. They don't know God. They don't know Christ. They don't know the Father. They don't know God in their mind. They think they know God, but Jesus says, you don't know him. Your mind is darkened. You're in a state of spiritual blindness, ignorance about who God really is. Look at verse 25 through 27. So they said to him, who are you? You see how they can't figure out who Jesus is? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I've heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Who are you, Jesus? I'm just who I've been telling you I am from the beginning. But your mind is so darkened that even though I've been telling you who I am for two and a half years, you can't figure it out. You don't have the light of life. You see, without Jesus, human beings don't see anything as it really is. Have any of you ever uh, had someone give you one of those uh, optical illusions? You know, it may be a, a piece of poster board that's got 2,000 chips of color on it, and they're all different sizes and different shapes and different colors, and they hold it up in front of you and say, what do you see here? You stare at it for about 30 seconds, and you say, ah, I see a bunch of color chips. And then they pull it back away from your face, and they say, oh, look here. Here's a man's nose, and here's his mouth, and here's his eyes, and here's his neck. And say, oh, I see that. I, I see that now. And then anytime you look at that uh, optical illusion, you can never see it the same way again. You see the man's face there. And when Jesus says, I'm the light of life, he says, I'm the one who shines light into the heart of and mind of men so that they might see reality as it is. When Jesus comes into a person's life via the Holy Spirit, they never see themselves the same way again. They never see God the same way again. They never see other people the same way again. He said, I am the light of the world. So light symbolizes knowledge. It symbolizes wisdom. It symbolizes uh, mental perception and understanding. And so when Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, he said, I'm the one that helps people to see the truth and perceive it. Also, light symbolizes in Scripture life and salvation. Life and salvation. Uh, light is a metaphor for life. Darkness is a metaphor for death in Scripture. And already, at the beginning of John's Gospel, he has told us this about Jesus, that Jesus is the light that brings life. This is a scripture that Lee read. John chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The life was the light of men. In other words, Jesus, John 1 tells us, is the creator of the physical world. He's the one who gives men life. He's the one who gives mankind uh, the ability to, to reason and think. He's the one who gives mankind a sense of right and wrong. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. But he also gives to men spiritual life. 
not just physical life, but spiritual life. And he warns these Jews that they don't have spiritual life. He issues a warning there in verse 21. Look at verse 21. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Look at verse 24. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's the most terrifying thing that any human being could hear. When Jesus looks at you and says, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus claims to be the light that gives spiritual life to men. He claims to be the one who can give men eternal life. He claims to be the one who can remove the darkness of the curse of sin and give us the light of life. Jesus warns that apart from the light of his salvation, that men will die in their sins. To die in your sins is to die under the wrath of a holy God. To die in your sins is to be uh, what the Bible calls cast into the outer darkness. Listen to Matthew 25, 30. This is the parable of the talents. Matthew 25, 30, Jesus says, Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, he said, I'm the one that can save you from the outer darkness, from the wrath of God, from dying in your sin, from being separated from God forever. Jesus Christ shed his precious blood at the cross of Calvary to pay for the sins of every person who would ever trust in him. There on the cross he endured the outer darkness of being forsaken by his Father so that we would never have to know the horror of dying in our sins. Apart from the light that cleanses from sin, apart from the light of his perfect righteousness credited to us, Apart from the light of His Spirit enabling us to trust Him as our Lord and Savior, we will die in our sins, and we will be cast into outer darkness forever. Unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins, Jesus said. Jesus warned these Jews. He said, I am going away, and you will seek me. He said, you will seek me, and you will die in your sins. Which is a stark reminder that we must seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Jesus says, there's coming a day when you're going to realize that I am who I said I was, and you're going to look for me, and it'll be too late. You'll seek me, but you won't find me, and you'll die in your sin. Seek Jesus today for the forgiveness of sins. Seek Jesus today for eternal life. Do you already know Christ? Seek him more. You will seek me. Jesus said, and you will die in your sins. There is coming a day when it will be too late to trust in Christ. It will be too late to follow Christ. It will be too late to seek Christ. A day when the door will be shut. A day when people will hear Jesus say to them, where I have gone, you cannot come. Then men will seek the light and the salvation of Christ, but they will not find him. This is, the, this is the problem that American people have. You never can get a sense of urgency on American people. You say, you're going to die. There's a holy God. There's a heaven. There's a hell. You need to get right with God. And people just yawn and look at you. And in the back of their mind, they're thinking, you know, I think they got a pill for that. I think somebody can invent something. I, I think the doctor can cure me. I think I'm going to go on living forever. No. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Jesus told these Jews, you will seek me and you will not find me. Church, only Jesus can grant the light of eternal life. That means that in a loving and an earnest way, we have to speak with our friends and our co-workers and our loved ones about the darkness of an eternity separated from the light of Christ. The darkness of dying in your sins. We need to talk to people about that in a loving way. Not that we're condemning them and we're all holy and they're not. But people need to know that there's a day of reckoning coming and that it is possible to die in your sins. The vast majority of people die in their sins and they step out 
into an eternity of blackness and misery forever. Broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there are that go down it. Narrow is the path that leads to life, and few there are that find it. In our culture of total tolerance, we're told this. It's harsh and unloving to speak of the dark fate of people who do not follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. But in light of God's word, it is a crime to remain silent. It is possible to die in your sin. It is possible to die without the light of life. Men will not turn to Christ until they see that they're in imminent danger of the wrath to come. If everybody's going to heaven, who needs Jesus? Who needs the light of life if there are a thousand pathways to God? So light stands for wisdom, knowledge, truth. It stands for life and salvation. And thirdly, light symbolizes holiness and moral purity in the Bible. Uh, the epistle of 1 John, not the gospel of John, but the epistle of 1 John, chapter 1 and verse 5 says this, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. In other words, God is so holy, so pure, so morally perfect, that the Bible can actually say God is light. When the Bible says God is light, it's referring to his moral perfection. Light is so symbolic of holiness and perfection that it is a symbol for God himself. So when Jesus claims to be the light of the world, he's claiming to be God. God is light. I am the light of the world. That is a claim to deity. Look at verse 28. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. Literally, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. For Jesus, the cross preceded the crown. And these Jews would crucify Him. They would lift Him up on the cross. But one day, they would wake up to the terrifying realization that Jesus was exactly who He claimed to be. God Almighty, the light of the world. When you've lifted up the Son of, uh, of Man, you'll know I am. Just before his crucifixion, Jesus gave this same kind of warning to the Sanhedrin as they condemned him to death in a mock trial the night before he was crucified. Mark 14, 62, Jesus tells them this. Uh, again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am. In other words, Jesus is saying, my crucifixion will give, re give way to my resurrection. And my resurrection will give way to my ascension. And my ascension will give way to my throne enthronement. And you will know that I am. You will know that I am God. Remember that at the Feast of Booths, Israel was celebrating how God had sustained them through their wilderness wanderings for 40 years. During that time, remember, God led them at night by a pillar of fire. Listen to Exodus 13, 21. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Light. So during the feast, these lamps were lit, and they were lit in the court of women to commemorate that pillar of fire, that light, that Shekinah glory that shined forth and guided God's people in the wilderness. And, and the whole city was lit up with this light from the court of women, okay? Now, verse 20 says this. Uh, it says, Jesus spoke these words in the treasury as he taught in the temple. So the treasury was in the court of women. Jesus stood right there where these candles were would have been lit, and he said, I'm the light of the world. These candles are meant to remember uh, the, the Shekinah, the glory cloud that shined at night and gave us light. What is Jesus saying? He said, I, I'm the one who was in the cloud when your ancestors were, were watered in the wilderness. That was me. I am the light of the world. I am God Almighty. God is light. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is God. Do you believe that Jesus is God today? Do you personally believe that Jesus Christ is God Almighty? 
Have you personally received Jesus as your God and Savior? Is your life a life that worships Jesus as God? When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he is claiming to be God Almighty. He's saying that there's no true knowledge of God apart from him. He's saying that he is the only source of all truth and life and salvation. He did not say, I am a light in the world. He said, I am the light of the world. That means that we have to be people, church, with a deep commitment to personal evangelism. We have to be a church with a deep commitment to missions because all other paths to God end in darkness. No matter how sincere, no matter how devout, no matter how committed, no matter how disciplined people are in their pursuit of God, it will be either Jesus or ignorance. It will be Jesus or eternal death. It will be Jesus or an idol. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's saying all other paths to God end in darkness. So, Jesus has claimed to be the light of the world. But after he makes this claim, he gives us a promise. Look at that in verse 12. Look at this promise. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Now remember how we said that light symbolizes holiness and moral purity. And then Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. In Scripture, a person's walk refers to a person's pattern of life. So Jesus is promising that if we will follow him, we will not live lives that are characterized by the pursuit of sin or darkness. Our lives won't be dominated by the high-handed, unrepentant chasing after of things that displease God, that he has said are sinful. Walking in darkness is the default position for the human race apart from Christ. But Jesus promises that if we'll follow him, that his light, the light of his life, will prevent sin from dominating our lives. I think that is a wonderful promise. Do you? Colossians 1, 13 to 14, Paul told the Christians there in Colossae, He, Jesus, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. He has transferred us from the domain of darkness. I don't know about you, but I do not want to be dominated by wickedness and sin. Jesus promises you, and he promises me, if you'll follow me, sin will not dominate your life. You'll have the light of life. The epistle of 1 John, chapter 3, and verse 8 says this, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. I'm the light of the world. If you'll follow me, you won't walk in darkness. I'll destroy the works of the devil in your life. Jesus is promising us in John 8, 12, that if we follow him, he will set our lives on a trajectory that is marked by increasing holiness instead of increasing sinfulness. You know, the pursuit, the pursuit of purity is the mark of a true Christian. We may not be able to see progress in holiness over the course of a week, or a month, or a year, but if you look at Brent Stewart 10 years from now, and I'm more sinful than I am today, you can say one thing about me with certainty. Brent Stewart was not a Christian when he was preaching to you today. Because Jesus promises, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. In fact, the Greek text has a double negative. Whoever follows me will no not walk in darkness. Will, will certainly not walk in darkness. Double negative is not good in English. It's okay in Greek. <laughs> that means that if the long-term trajectory of an individual's life is toward greater and greater sexual immorality, 
greater and greater greediness, greater and greater pride or selfishness or self-righteousness or substance abuse or jealousy or envy or any other dark sinful path. Is that, if that's a trajectory you're on and you're pursuing it and going that way more and more, that's proof that the, he or she is not a Christian and does not have the light of life. Whoever follows me will no not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the negative is you won't walk in darkness. The positive is you will have the light of life. See that at the end of verse 12? Jesus promises his people that we will have his life within us. If Jesus is the light and he promises that we will have the light of life, then the light of life is Jesus living within you and me in the person of the Holy Spirit. What a promise. If you'll follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit will show you the truth. He'll cause you to increasingly hate sin and love holiness. He'll come and live in you. He'll enable you to know God. He will give you the eternal life that is in Jesus himself. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. You see, Christians don't have dark hearts and dark minds anymore. Yes, we still battle the flesh. We have indwelling sin. We think awful things. But all is not pitch black on the inside anymore. There's a light there. We have the light of life. As we follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit is progressively renewing the mind and the heart and the life of somebody who has been converted, who is born again, who is really a Christian. Let me read a few verses, and I want you to listen for the language of renewal. And as you hear the word renew or renewal, think about the light of life. That's what the Holy Spirit does in the hearts and minds of Christians. He is constantly giving us life, constantly renewing our mind. Listen to Colossians 3.10. Paul says, You have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Romans 12.2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what's the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 2 Corinthians 4.16 So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. This light of life that Jesus promised, uh, promises to us is imparted to us by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Paul said this in Titus 3.5 God saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Is there any renewing power in you today? Do you have the Holy Spirit? If you do, He will be shining the light of life, the light of Christ in you. And your life is not going to be more and more sin, more and more pursuit of uh, wickedness, more and more pursuit of unholiness. There is something, don't let me say something, there is somebody in you, the Holy Spirit, who is renewing you who is giving you the light of life and setting you on a different trajectory, a trajectory of holiness. This light of life, this source of renewal and transformation and hunger for Christ is what keeps followers of Jesus from walking in the darkness. It's not our own innate goodness. It's not the fact that we pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and try harder not to sin. It's because God is living in his people in the person of the Holy Spirit. This light of life is the light of Christ. The life of Christ implanted in the human soul by God the Holy Spirit. This is basically the same thing Jesus was saying last week in John 7, 37. If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. From his inmost being will flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water and the light of life are pretty much the same thing. You know, the American church tries all kinds of man-made programs and tactics to get its converts, and I use that word loosely, to stop being drunks and porn addicts and drug abusers and serial fornicators, or even just to get them to show up to church on Sunday morning. Perhaps you've been in churches like this. We take a little AA, and we sprinkle in some pop psychology. 
we throw in 10 Bible verses out of context, maybe we can get our converts to quit looking at porn every day. You know, getting saved has a way of taking care of stuff like that, doesn't it? Can I get an amen? amen? It's amazing what having the Holy Spirit will do for a person. It's amazing what being born again will do. It's amazing what being converted will do. It's amazing what having the light of life will do for things like that over time. Now, I'm not saying that Christians enter into some kind of state of sinless perfection as soon as they're saved. But I am saying this. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus says that this promise of the light of life is for whoever follows me. Whoever follows me. Following Jesus means that we commit ourselves to him as our Savior and King without any reservation. Following Jesus equals believing in Jesus. There's no difference between being a follower of Jesus and being somebody who believes in Jesus. There is no such thing as a Christian who does not follow Jesus. Following Christ is the evidence that we're really Christians. It's the evidence that we have the light of life. If I ask the people who know you best, is this person a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, what would they say? I can deceive myself. But what would people who know me best say about me? Would they say, Brent Stewart is a follower of Jesus? If all of them said no, you could seriously doubt whether I'm a Christian. This is the problem with decisionism. Okay? So, uh, in, in the American South, uh, we have this flag with a cross on it. We'll, we'll call this the Christian banner. And under the Christian banner, there are two things that exist. There is Christianity, and there is this other religion called decisionism. Okay? And the problem with decisionism, which is the notion that if someone has made a decision for Christ, that he or she is forever saved, is that even if they don't show any interest in discipleship after they make this decision, no interest in following Christ, no interest in learning and obeying what Jesus has revealed to us in the Bible. No interest in personal holiness. No interest in prayer. No commitment to a gospel-centered body of believers. That certainly that person is still going to heaven when they die because they made a decision. Jesus said, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus did not say, whoever makes a decision and then goes on with life as normal will have the light of life. That is emphatically what he did not say. One pastor uh, puts it this way. He says, he, this pastor grew up in South Carolina, so he knows, he knows Bible Belt Christianity. He says, I grew up among a few million one-point Calvinists who misunderstood their one point. Once saved, always saved. In general... It meant that if Johnny asked Jesus into his heart at age six, left the church at 16, mocked Jesus for 10 years, and died in Vietnam with a bullet hole through his playboy money that he was in heaven. That's decisionism. That's not Christianity. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Uh, let's put it a different way, negatively. Whoever does not follow me will have the darkness of death. In other words, if you're not following Jesus, you don't have the light of life. You don't have eternal life. You're not a Christian. The decision that needs to be made is not the decision to be saved. It is the decision to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. Most people in our churches, you ask them, why will you go to heaven? Because I decided to be saved. Well, you and everybody else in the world. My question is this. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Because that shows that you've been born again, that you have a heart of flesh, that you have love and affection for him. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. You see, Jesus won't follow us. We have to follow him. 
That means that Jesus is not the fire insurance policy that we tack on to the life that we were already living while we continue on with business as usual. Following Jesus means that by faith in him, we are seeking to increasingly conform our lives to his revealed will in Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus will not be an addition to my life or to your life. He will either be your life or you will not have life. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. What the sun is to the entire solar system, the source of light and heat and life, Jesus Christ has come into the world to be just that for sinners like me and sinners like you. If you'll follow him as your Savior and your God, he will keep the darkness of this world and the darkness of your own soul from overtaking you. He will be your everlasting light and he will bring you into a kingdom where he himself is the light. Listen to Revelation 21, 23 to 25. John says, The heavenly city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. I am the light of the world. In the heavenly city, the Lamb is the Lamb. Is God working in your heart this morning? Do you want to follow Jesus as your Savior and as your God without any reservation? I'll be glad to talk to you after church. I'll be glad to meet with you anytime this week and talk with you, pray with you. Uh, if you're a, a woman and you want to talk to another woman, Sandra's sitting right here. She'll be glad to talk, pray, counsel with you. If you need prayer and you want to follow Jesus, get in the women's Bible study. If you, want, if you need prayer and you want to follow Christ, come on Wednesday night. There are men there who will pray for you. But don't sit there and do nothing. Follow him. Follow Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus, the light of the world. And we confess that apart from him, we have no good thing. Apart from him, our minds are dark, our hearts are dark, our deeds are dark, and our eternity will be permanent darkness, outer darkness apart from him. But we thank you that he is a gracious and a generous Savior, that he's come into this world to be a light for sinners, the light of life, the light that is life. And I pray that we'd find life in him today. I pray that those who already have that life would have even more. And that those who do not, Lord, would be convicted of sin and righteousness and judgment and flee to the wounds of Christ for cleansing and flee to Christ as King. And Lord, that you would make him our joy, that you would make him everything to us, Lord. Forgive us for we have not seen Jesus as bright and beautiful. I ask, Lord, that where people who are listening this morning have been deceived by false prophets who say, peace, peace, when there is no peace, that you would show them that, that you would shine the light of truth in their hearts, and that every one of us would have a right and a true understanding of where we stand with you, Lord. Because there is coming a time when the door will be shut, when we'll seek Christ, but we won't find him. Help us to find him today. Help us to follow him by faith. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand, we will sing our glory and my redeemer one more time.
shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting life, and your days at morning shall be in it. Go in the light of Christ. 